the snow around Moscow, the rapid advance of the Nazi war machine has been halted. This time, blitzkrieg tactics have failed to deliver a swift victory. Nazi Germany needs more tanks and guns fast, but its economy isn't ready for a long drawn out war. And to make things worse, a plane crash has led to the death of the very man Hitler needs to arm and supply his war machine. Minister of Armaments, Fritz Todt. It's a chance to save the Nazi war effort. And for Hitler's number two, Hermann Goering, this is an ideal opportunity to repair a once glittering reputation. Goering's career may be in the doldrums, but he has good reason to believe that he is the obvious choice. Goering is banking on being put in full control of the supply and manufacture of armaments. But when he arrives at the Fuhrer's office, he gets a nasty surprise. Hitler has already found a new man to rearm Germany, his chief architect, Albert Speer. But a move like this should come as no surprise to Goering, as Hitler likes to keep his inner circle in check by keeping those closest to him on the back foot. Albert Speer had first met Hitler almost a decade earlier, when, as a relatively inexperienced architect, he was asked to submit designs for the Nuremberg Rally. To the young architect's surprise and excitement, the Führer invited him to regular luncheons to discuss his own architectural dreams for a new Germany. Speer would soon show that he could also undertake major projects, including Hitler's new Reich Chancellery, which was built within a year. The architect may have no experience of armament production, but so far in the eyes of the Führer, he hasn't put a foot wrong. But Speer's appointment is a massive gamble. With the United States entering the war, the future of Nazi Germany is now dependent on knocking out the Soviet Union before it's too late. It's a daunting challenge, but Speer's first hurdle is to deal with the very man who wanted his job. Speer now finds himself thrust into the bear pit of Hitler's inner circle surrounded by dangerous men who all jealously guard their grip on power. And Goering is itching to put the young upstart in his place. Hitler's number two receives Speer like a pompous patrician, telling the newbie just to follow his lead and all will be well. Speer may be a political novice, but he has come prepared. He can't push Goering around, but Hitler can. He reveals a decree from the Führer himself. Speer is playing his trump card, his personal bond with the Führer. With Goering out of the way, Speer gets to work. And as an outsider, he brings some much needed reforms. Crucially, Speer has good news for his Führer. He expects production of armored vehicles to double by the end of the year. Speer's star is growing ever brighter. However, this unique friendship is being watched enviously. Bormann is the head of the Nazi Party Chancellery and Hitler's closest aide. This wily bureaucrat has made it his life's work to become the Führer's official shadow. Over and above the daily access, it's Speer's emotional connection with the Führer that hurts most. Through his unique relationship with the Führer, Speer has made a dangerous enemy in Bormann. But the realities of war soon present more pressing problems for Hitler's new minister. 
summer 1942, Operation Case Blue is underway. It's the Führer's grand plan to finally knock Soviet Russia out of the war. But as more and more men are sent to the front, there are fewer left to work in Speer's factories. Speer knows where he can find labor, but it means dealing with the most feared and fanatical member of Hitler's inner circle, SS boss Heinrich Himmler. Although names like Auschwitz and Dachau are synonymous with the extermination of millions of Jews and other political prisoners, Himmler's vast network of concentration camps are also a vital source of labor. The problem is, he wants to keep them for himself. With Himmler reluctant to cooperate, Speer is keen to find other sources of labor. Luckily, there is a man with a mutual interest itching to get back into the Führer's thoughts, Joseph Goebbels. Goebbels is the Nazi head of propaganda and one of Hitler's most devoted followers. But the spin master has recently found himself drifting from the center of power. However, Goebbels has found inspiration from an unlikely source, someone who has made a virtue out of stoicism and self-sacrifice. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many long months of struggle and of suffering. I say to the House, as I said to those who have joined the government, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Goebbels believes that he too can inspire the German people to join the war effort on every front. And he sees a potential ally in Albert Speer. Goebbels pitches a program of austerity measures, one of which could solve Speer's labor problem. The conscription of German women onto the factory floor is an obvious solution, but they both know Hitler would take some convincing. After months of discussion, Speer and Goebbels present their new plan. It's called Total War. However, Hitler is reluctant to accept the need for women to build munitions or do anything that might bring the war closer to home. And the idea of German women working in factories also goes against Hitler's ideological goals for a Germanic master race. Despite Hitler's reservations, Speer and Goebbels don't give up. Too much is at stake. This is devastating news for Speer and Goebbels. They must now share control of their project with a major inner circle rival. While Bormann gets his claws into Goebbels and Speer's total war project, a beleaguered Hermann Goering spies a way to exploit a developing crisis in the East. Stalingrad. As the Russian winter returns, the Führer's Sixth Army has found itself surrounded by Stalin's troops. But Hitler will not allow a tactical withdrawal. His men must hold the city as a matter of principle. The original plan had been to focus on destroying the industrial capacity of the city and control its river, the Volga, a crucial supply route to the Russian heartland. But now, after months of being bogged down in bloody street fighting, his army is in desperate need of supplies. One man, however, has a plan to save the day and salvage his own reputation. Goering proposes an audacious plan to use his Luftwaffe to create an air bridge to supply the besieged troops. Faced with ice, snow, and freezing fog, 
Goering's pilots begin what his own senior staff already fear is an impossible task. As days turn into weeks without fuel or food, the 6th Army is losing as many soldiers by starvation and cold as it is by enemy bullets. Goering's promise has proven to be a catastrophically empty one. On the anniversary of the Führer's accession to power, Goering, in an attempt to disguise his own failure, tells the German troops perishing in the snow, their sacrifice will not be forgotten. One day it will be said, when you come to Germany, tell them you have seen us lay down our lives at Stalingrad, as the law, that is to say, the law of the security of our people, commanded. But Goering's own humiliation is only just beginning. As he starts his speech, the sirens wail over Berlin. For the first time, the Allies feel confident enough to attack Berlin in broad daylight. It's a humiliating reminder of another promise Goering failed to keep. As bombs rain down on Berlin, the Führer is reeling from the loss of over 200,000 men in Stalingrad. In front of his staff, Hitler blames the Italians, Romanians and Hungarians fighting alongside his Sixth Army. But within the inner circle, everyone knows Goering is the real fall guy. Humiliated, the once heroic fighter ace soon slips back into old habits. Back in 1923, during the Nazis' first failed attempt to seize power, Goering had been shot and severely wounded. And now, as his addiction once again rears its head, the old fighter is losing his appetite to be Hitler's number two and successor. Martin Bormann's power, however, continues to grow as he cynically exploits Hitler's preoccupation with the Eastern Front. Even though the Stalingrad crisis has prompted Hitler to allow Speer and Goebbels to enact some of their total war measures, Bormann is continually looking to minimize their scope and impact. But for Joseph Goebbels, the king of propaganda, there is another way to bypass Bormann and show Hitler that Germany is ready for total war. Go public and let the people decide. In front of a carefully selected audience, Goebbels seizes the opportunity to turn Stalingrad into a story of heroic sacrifice and tell the German people that it's now their turn to join the war effort. But this wasn't just a Churchillian call to arms. Goebbels wants to show Hitler that all Germans are ready to do whatever it takes. speech has put Speer and Goebbels' plans back on track. Thousands of German women register for work, and vitally, the Führer is impressed.
Now is the time to target Borman, and they think they found a chink in his bureaucratic armor, a way to beat the schemer at his own game. Though this defense council had been lying dormant, its powers are still in place. And if resurrected, it could be used to bypass Borman's bureaucratic barricade around the Fuhrer. But there's a hitch. The man in charge of this dormant agency is also out of action. Speer and Goebbels need Goering on side, but it's uncertain that he's up to the job. Someone needs to snap Goering out of his slump, but he's not even talking to Goebbels because total war measures have led to the closure of Goering's favorite restaurant. So it falls to Speer to coax the old fighter back into the ring. Speer takes full advantage of their mutual dislike and distrust for Borman. The two men agree a plan to chip away at Borman's influence. The first step to target and discredit one of his stooges at a meeting over the still vital issue of labor supply. As head of the Resurrected Council, Goering will lead the attack. For a man new to politics, Speer has put together an unlikely coalition. Together with Goebbels and Goering, they can finally take Bormann down a peg or two. But as Speer arrives, something's not right. Goebbels is nowhere to be seen. And Bormann has a new friend, Heinrich Himmler. And it soon gets worse. Goering goes off script and starts attacking Speer's deputy. With Goebbels absent and Goering's about face, it's clear Speer has been betrayed. For Himmler, still jealously guarding his control of concentration camp labor, any attempt by Speer to gain more power is a potential threat. For Speer, it's a painful reminder that his inner circle rivals will do anything to protect their personal positions over and above the crisis Germany faces. But he's learning fast. His battle for control of the war economy isn't over yet. Summer 1943. The world witnesses the biggest tank battle in history, but also Nazi Germany's last strategic offensive on the Eastern Front. Nazi Germany is now fighting for survival. And while Allied bombs pummel its industrial heartland, Speer is still battling to convince Hitler to fully mobilize the home front. Speer wants every factory to be turned over to the war effort. No more luxuries or non-essential goods. The war is now on everyone's doorstep. To do this, Speer needs dictatorial control over Germany's economy. And it appears the message is finally hitting home. Speer has risen from political novice to a position of immense power but he knows that his austerity measures will not be popular among many senior Nazis, and that Bormann is waiting to pounce. But this time Speer is not going to be outmaneuvered. In autumn 1943, Speer presents his new plan, but also a new partner. Speer's old adversary appears to have had a change of heart. Speer announces that the SS will ensure that production of all non-essential consumer goods will stop within two weeks. No more radio sets, refrigerators, or cosmetics. It's an all-out war against what Speer calls the Skyvers and the Malingerers. But the lectures are not over. 
What follows is one of the few recorded speeches by a senior Nazi regarding what will become the single worst crime against humanity, the Holocaust. In his efforts to secure victory, Speer has made a pact with the devil. Yet he would later claim that he hadn't stayed to hear his new ally's incriminating words. But in reality, Speer has never had any moral qualms about using Jewish and foreign slave labor. And now with SS cooperation, tens of thousands of people will be worked to death, building roads, fortifications, and new weapons in his bid to save the Nazi regime. Perversely, Speer would claim that his workers at least had a chance to live. However, the death rate of those building his new secret weapon, the V2, was the highest in the entire Nazi concentration camp system. However, new wonder weapons alone are not going to save Nazi Germany. Despite Allied bombing and dwindling resources, Speer's factories continue to build more and more tanks and planes. But by January 1944, as the Soviets begin to enter Poland and the Allies move up the Italian peninsula, the stark reality is Germany no longer has the soldiers to use its new resources. Whereas the Führer refuses to accept any notion of defeat, the reality of the situation is taking its toll on his most able minister. Stress and anxiety is pushing Speer to breaking point. Exhausted, Speer admits himself into the SS clinic at Hohenlich. The clinic is run by a physician with a rather dubious reputation. Speer develops depression and his anxiety increases as he refuses to stop working. Speer's concerns are justified, as rumors soon start spreading within his own ministry that he is incurably ill. In an almost pathetic cry for help, he writes to the Führer complaining that his own staff are scheming against him. But as his condition deteriorates, there are concerns that Speer's rivals want to kill off more than his career. How Speer got so close to death is mystifying, but his long-serving secretary, Anne-Marie Kempf, would claim that it wasn't an accident. Whatever Himmler's intentions were, Speer does eventually recover, suggesting this conspiracy theory is more of a devious creation by its supposed victim. What is certain is that illness has enabled Speer's rivals to continue to undermine him. Bormann, in particular, has been busy. Speer's aggressive speech to the senior Nazis' district leaders has created a severe backlash. Bormann has finally won. Speer's monthly phone calls with Hitler are now a distant memory. Absence and a willingness to push against vested interests has led to Speer losing what matters most, the confidence and authority of his Führer. As Nazi Germany faces a final showdown against Soviet Russia and the Allies, Speer's inner circle rivals remain focused on their own push for power. Goebbels' campaign to become Minister for Total War is gaining new impetus every day. And with Speer neutralized, Himmler can continue building up and supplying his own army of SS fanatics. As for Speer, he is down, but not out. In what will become a fight for survival, Speer will implicate himself in the ultimate act of treachery, the betrayal of the Führer himself.